Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's program hosted by the Willamette University Sustainability Network. My name is Eric Lasson, and I work here in alumni and parent engagement. Thanks to you all for joining us. Before we begin, let me share a few logistical items. I'll be acting as our staff support for this session. You can use the chat tab to ask questions or let me know if you're having technical difficulties, and I'll do my best to assist you. Please be sure that your microphone is muted during the presentation portion of our program. And this session today is intended to help current students and young alums connect with Bearcats who are established in sustainability oriented career fields. And I can't wait for you to meet our panelists. There's something really cool about checking in with your panelists and one responds, good to go from Ghana. And the other responds, same from Rome. So a little bit more about our panelists real quick. Um, Keith Cressman is from the, uh, the College of Arts and Sciences from 1981. Um, and he's in uh, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, and he's a senior locust forecasting officer. And Keith graduated in 1981, as I mentioned, with a degree in biology. He joined the Peace Corps as a volunteer for two years in Tunisia, and then returned to work for two years with USDA on cotton pests in Arizona. After obtaining an MSc degree in international agriculture development, plant protection from UC Davis, he joined FAO in 1987. Initially, he was posted in Sudan for a year, which coincided with the last desert locust plague. He then returned to FAO headquarters in Rome, where he has been providing Desert locust forecasts and early warning, early warning to countries as FAO's top locust expert for more than three decades. He has also established innovative early warning systems for other transboundary pests, such as the fall armyworm and red palm weevil. And Daniel, also from CAS from College of Arts and Sciences, but in 1982, and he works for the U.S. Agency for International Development as a Foreign Service Officer. And so Daniel graduated from Willamette with a degree in environmental science, and he served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Cameroon and worked as a soil scientist for the U.S. Forest Service in California. After obtaining an MSc in International Agriculture Development and Soil science from UC Davis. I, I sense a theme here. He began his US AID career in 1990, serving in Cameroon, Uganda, Washington, Tunisia, Philippines, and Ethiopia, where he managed development programs in agriculture, environment, energy, and trade. Daniel entered the US AID senior management in 2011, serving tours in Tunisia and Mali. Since 2018, he serves as USAID and West Africa Regional Mission Director based in Accra, Ghana, where he oversees regional and bilateral development programs in health, peace and governance, and economic growth. Daniel hails from Palo Alto, California, is married with two sons, and is an avid helio <laughs> How do you say it? Keith can pronounce it. That is a that is a cool term, and I can't wait to hear more about what that actually is. <laughs> All right, and so to really get us started now, I will also introduce our host, um, our our, uh, our our consistent host of so many of these programs. I'm really appreciative of Marshall Curry. Marshall serves as the Epic Network Program Manager. In this role, he serves as a global community builder working with leaders in higher education, governments, and nonprofits to tackle the biggest challenges in local communities. He earned his Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from Willamette in 2013. Marshall is a leader and key organizer for the Alumni Affinity Group Willamette University Sustainability Network. So thanks for hosting us today, Marshall, and I'll hand it off to you. Thanks, Eric, I really appreciate it. And thank you to our panelists for being here today. Uh, and thank you for our attendees for also being here. I'm really excited for your questions uh, as we get in their way. Um, please feel free to use the chat as we get going. Um, I wanna make sure 
I check with Eric real quick on the question I put in chat. Um, but uh, um, regarding the your questions as we get underway, attendees, please feel free to use the chat um, in real time as we'll make sure to break uh, for those. But we'll, we'll also give you a, a Q and A portion at the end of the uh, like the last twenty minutes or so for Q and A. I think um, depending on depending on how uh, Keith and Daniel. Um, to take on the topics because I didn't realize you you two might have been classmates. So we might have longer answers to things than I expected. But anyway, um, do you see my question in the chat? And I answered yes. Oh, okay, great. Um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't see it come through in the chat. That's weird. Okay. Um, so uh, let me start with the land acknowledgement uh, that we use for Willamette University events. I want to make sure uh, we do that and then we'll get underway. We are gathered on the land of the Kalapuya, who today are represented by the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron and the Confederated Tribes of the Selects Indians, whose relationship with this land continues to this day. We offer gratitude to the land itself, for those who have stewarded it for generations, and for the opportunity to study, learn, work, and be in community on this land. We acknowledge that our university's history is fundamentally tied to the first violent colonial developments in the Willamette Valley. Finally, we respectfully acknowledge and honor past, present, and future indigenous students of Willamette. Thank you. As we consider the content of this presentation, please also consider your own positionality and how to take today's lessons to honor those negatively impacted by histories, histories similar to our university. I know that uh, Daniel and Keith, through your work, your really impacting and living out the motto. Um, those people have also been impacted by colonialism. So I really appreciate your efforts. Uh, personally, as I read about your bios, as, um, as uh, our fellow Wusin member, um, uh, Diana Ibarra mentioned you two as, as potential speakers. She spoke very highly of you and, and we read about what you all do and uh, we were very excited about it uh, in, in bringing you in today. So thank you for joining us uh, and thank you for your work. Um, and let me get started with a couple of lightning round questions just to kind of get uh, the mute, the microphones working. Uh, and just a couple of questions uh, or a couple of words. Um, could you please just introduce uh, yourself? Sorry, skip that question. Could you please um, list any great meals you had in the last week? Uh, I realize food is a great way for people to connect and this wasn't on the script, sorry, but I'm going off the script a little bit to start. Um, you all are in Rome, you're in Ghana, uh, we're all over the world. So just really quickly, like, what's a meal that you really enjoyed in the last week? Daniel, you want me to say something first? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you go ahead. I, all right. I mean, I mean, last night's dinner at home was really great. Huh? My wife made us some homemade pasta. We, we have something called one dish where it just dump a bunch of uh, rucola, and greens and and pasta and vegetables into a into a bowl and stir it around and add pesto and eat it and with the red wine of course <laughs> i'll second the red wine so so <laughs> my, my wife is not here with me she's in the states en route to her next posting in, in mozambique uh, i've spent a lot a lot of years in africa and i'm fortunate to have uh, a, a housekeeper and cook from from congo and she made my favorite dish last week, and I've, eat, I've been eating it several days in a row, which is cassava leaves and dried tuna mixed with a bunch of spices. And I eat that with uh, these big, uh, juicy African yams. It's so sweet and tasty. Sounds very good. Cool. Uh, next uh, lightning round question. Uh, what's your favorite Salem or Willamette University uh, like place? Or like landmark. Yeah, that's that that's a tough one. Uh, you know, we should probably both say the Ram Pub, which was Keith and I were fraternity <laughs> brothers, Kappa Sigmas, and I don't know if it's still there. But it was a pub at the end of the. The Ram's summer. still there. Okay, but I won't say that. You know, I think Willamette is fortunate to have uh, the Willamette River nearby, and there's there's a park. I forget what the name of the park is, but there's like a of a, a, um, a merry-go-round type thing there. Yeah. yeah, it's a really cool place to to hang out. I, I, I will say that. Keith, how about you? 
Yeah, I agree with Daniel. Much the same. Also across the street in the Capitol is beautiful. The Capitol grounds there. Yeah. All right. And then moving on to the longer winded questions um, or longer winded. I mean, done in a positive way. Uh, sorry about that. Um, could you pl please provide, you know, just like a, an overview of the journey you took to get to where you're at in your careers today? Eric took care of your bio, but I was wondering for our folks who are early career or they're currently still in school, could you just help them see the journey to where you where you got to today in just a couple minutes? Um, Keith and and whoever can go first. Sorry, he's my big brother, so I, I defer to him. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I think I um, when I graduated from from Willamette it, with a degree in biology, kind of at that time there there's two things you could do: you could go and be a doctor and, and sweat through med school, and I didn't really have good enough grades and and probably the the attention to go through med school. And the other thing was to do something else. And I couldn't find anything else to do, but I heard, um, I had a friend, uh, his name was Tersh McCracken, also a Kappa Sig brother. And, and there is a Peace Corps recruiter that came to the campus and they're kind of like telling us about the Peace Corps. So I remember I went to that and I thought joining the Peace Corps sounded really cool because I could defer my student loan and I get maybe, I don't know, $1,000 after two years or something in a bank somewhere. And um, so, yeah, I ended up doing that and that really changed my whole life completely. Because there, you know, I got a taste of Africa. I went to Tunisia. I learned Arabic and lived in a small village and, you know, all of those things. And, um, yeah, that, that just really wanted me to, to continue to find a career working overseas. It just kind of wet my appetite. I, I came back to the States and, okay, I did some work with the USDA. And, and um, you know, I, it, that was good because I could ski in the winter in, in Arizona. So, so that was cool. But then, you know, I went, went to grad school because I knew I needed to get a, a grad degree and, and I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And it was really weird because Daniel and I, we had, you know, we had graduated, I graduated a year before he did, but, you know, we'd gone through three years together in Kappa Sig and, and everything. And, and we we're good friends. And then, you know, we went in our own directions. And then I went to grad school in Davis <laughs> There I found Daniel again, and it was like, whoa, deja vu. And that that was really, really crazy. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what happened in my case. Thanks, Keith. What a, yeah. <laughs> excited to hear Daniel's story of that and whether he had the same positive reaction. Yeah. Well, you. A similar trajectory, <laughs> but it, it, it's worthy of note, you know, those early intersections. This is the first time I've actually had interaction face to face with with Keith in, in 30 years. We've been in touch from time to time, aware of where each other uh, are, but this is this is pretty pretty cool to see him after all these years. So after leaving Willamette, again, my, my uh, degree was environmental science, actually with a, 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 a double major in German lit as well. Um, I kind of did nothing for it. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I took kind of a, a year to think things through. I was aware that two of my fraternity brothers, Tersh and Keith had gone into the Peace Corps and I was interested in that. So I also sought out a Peace Corps recruiter and a year after graduating, I went into the Peace Corps in Cameroon teaching math and physics. I learned two things in that experience. One was I did not wanna be a teacher uh, but second, I wanted to work in development. And it wasn't that I wanted necessarily to help other countries develop, but I found the environment of living overseas in a developing, a developing country intellectually, spiritually uh, in, invigorating and, and exciting. Curiously, I don't like to travel, but I like being in these environments. So I decided to work in development and knowing that development jobs are rather scarce, but that they needed like a master's degree in experience. I picked a field that would work either domestically or internationally, which and turned out to be soil science. And that led to my master's degree uh, at, at UC Davis. Similar to Keith's journey, uh, I, I, I gained a little experience using my Peace Corps, uh, what is it called, non-competitive eligibility to easily get a job with the U.S. Forest Service. I worked uh, a little bit up in Northern California, uh, but development jobs are a bit, a bit hard to find. So I rolled the dice, I took a chance. I went to Cameroon where I had served as a Peace Corps volunteer, you know, five years later with my degree looking for work. And I landed a job uh, with USAID, US Agency for International Development 
as a local hire consultant making a hundred bucks a day. And I parlayed that after a year of establishing myself, showing folks I could do the job to an international contractor position uh, in Cameroon. I got a similar position in Uganda managing uh, biodiversity programs. And then at that point, I had enough experience to join USAID as a foreign service officer, which I did in, in 99. And since then, um, I, I've been with USAID, served in multiple countries, uh, 30, uh, been USAID all total for 32 years now. 30 of those years have been overseas. It's a little bit atypical for a foreign service officer. And of those 30 years overseas, 25 have been uh, in Africa. I'll stop there. Thanks, Daniel. I realized that uh, as you were sharing your, your, your bio and also I, I was looking back a little bit on, on your bio written in written form. Um, I, I think I've connected with the other coordinator for the Southern part of uh, USAID for my work. So I was like, oh, I know exactly what you do now. <laughs> didn't, didn't click when I read your bio the first time. And anyway, um, thank you for both for showing, sharing your journey with us. Um, I'm curious about your current role. Could you speak more about like, what is it you do in your day to day now that you're, you're in that, in this role? Okay. Um, basically um, what I'm supposed to do is, is I'm like a weather forecaster, but I, I forecast um, desert locust plagues. So, you know, these are the, the grasshopper type of insect, you know, that can form these great massive clouds of, of kind of swarms that block out the sun and, and, and do a lot of damage to, to agriculture and pastures. Um, and so uh, because of FAO's role, which is, you know, the, the, um, the UN agency that deals with all the agriculture and, and food issues, um, we have kind of the global um, view of, of, of everything concerning food and agriculture. And so this fits in quite nicely with, with desert locusts, because these are migratory pests that basically are everywhere in the deserts of North Africa and Arabia and Southwest Asia. So like from West Africa to India. And so it's about 20% of the land surface on, on, on this planet. So it's a huge area. Um, and the thing is, you know, you, um, you don't want plagues to happen. And so everything is about early warning and prevention and monitoring and, you know, all of these things. And so that's basically what I do is, is um, I work with about 50 different countries and um, uh, analyze all the data that's coming into my office from those countries. And then I um, use you know, my experience and kind of a, you know, a lot of intuition to predict what's going to happen in the future and then provide the early warning to, to the country. So it's kind of like, you know, early warning of hurricanes or, or, or bad weather or stuff like that. And then it's the countries up to them to kind of um, stop, you know, the locusts in their tracks before it gets worse. So, um, yeah, I've been doing that for, well, 34 years now. Um, and, and it's a long time to do a single job, basically. Okay, yeah, there's been a career path within that. Huh? But, you know, the point is that um, it's kept my attention because it's super challenging. I mean, people try to model, you know, desert locust predictions, but it was, it's too complex because there's all sorts of different kind of, um, let's say, dimensions. And, and um, you have to be kind of a jack of all trades. You need to know a lot about meteorology, about biology, entomology. Um, a lot about geography, cultures as well, you know, um, politics. Um, and it brings all of these kind of into the soup. Um, and, and then, you know, we have all these new uh, technical innovations that, you know, we have to keep up with. Um, and it, it's great. And I think for me, the most satisfying part of all of that is, is working with the countries directly themselves. So even though I work in within the giant UN bureaucracy administrative structure, I'm very fortunate because my, my job is super unique. It's a very niche job. There's nobody else in the world that forecasts locusts, I suppose. So I, I can avoid all the admin and all the bureaucracy and work technically directly with, with the technical um, people in the countries. So I'm working with, you know, so many different nationalities and different languages. And I think as Daniel said, you know, th that's extremely uh, rewarding. In fact, that, that really um, drives, at least in my case, drives me and keep, keeps, keeps my attention. 
I have a quick follow up for you before we move on. Sorry, Daniel, get you in just a second. Um, could you tell just a little bit more for folks who might not be aware of like what it entails? Could you describe a little bit more about the warning systems and, and what they're in place for and how you set them up? I know you talked a little bit about, you know, you're talking with the people, you're using all these different systems, but can you just a little bit more there? And I think that'll be helpful for our, our attendees. Yeah, basically, I mean, in, in countries that are affected by desert locusts, they have national teams that their job is to get in a Land Rover and drive around in the desert, look for green vegetation and and look for, for locusts in that vegetation. And they're using um, digital tools like smartphones and tablets attached to satellites to, to um, move that data from the middle of nowhere to, to their national locust centers and then up to, um, to my office in Rome where I have the, the full complete picture. And then I take all of that data, I combine it with remote sensing imagery, you know, from satellites about where it's rain, where the vegetation is green, where the soil is moist, um, and a historical data that goes back about 100 years. So we have a giant kind of database. And, and I use what we call geographical information system, GIS. I think most people know what that is, um, to, to analyze all of that data um, spatially. Um, to come up with with predictions um, that then I, I send out directly to the country. So it can be to ministers of agriculture, it can be to the national um, locust programs, to FAO, to NGOs, to other agencies. So that every, everyone's informed on what the current situation is and then, you know, how it could develop in, into something worse. So usually I forecast for about six weeks in advance. Um, sometimes I could forecast up to half a year in advance. Um, now with the, the changing climate, of course, it's it's another variable in the mix there that keeps things even more interesting. Thank you. That really helps. Um, also, maybe helpful for things not related to locusts, but just located to or similar to monitoring at a local level, big things, right? Or across geographical impacts. Anyway, Daniel, please, could you uh, answer so the problem? To start well? off, is it, am I the only one concerned here that one of the tools Keith is using to predict movement of deadly swarms of locusts uh, is his intuition? Yeah, uh, you caught on that, didn't you? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I think you're the only one who knows him well enough to do so. But then again, you haven't seen him face to face for 30 years. So maybe... <laughs> Maybe we should all call him out on it. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So, so before I, I explain what my current role is, I want to make sure people understand what USAID is. So you, the U.S. Agency for International Development is, is your taxpayer dollars at, at work. We're an independent U.S. government agency that administers the civilian uh, foreign aid and development assistance. So this is pursuant to advancing our uh, foreign policy and national uh, uh, interests. So we have an annual budget of about $30 million and about 9,000 staff spread all around the world. 1,800 of those staff are foreign service officers like me. Uh, so I have a commission, which means basically that I am worldwide available and every one, two, four years, uh, I am sent to a new assignment somewhere to do something. So uh, our headquarters is in Washington, DC. Uh, but we have USAID missions and offices all around the world, mostly in developing countries, obviously, which are part of the U.S. Embassy. So my current assignment, which started in 2018, I am the USAID West Africa Regional Mission Director based in Accra, Ghana, where I manage a set of both regional and bilateral development programs uh, with an annual budget of about $250 million dollars. I have about 270 staff spread across five West African countries. Um, the, uh, so I manage both regional programs and bilateral programs. I'll talk a little bit about the, the regional programs. I think you'll find them more interesting. So regional programs are things that like locusts are, are cross border in, in nature or things that are best done on a multi-country or wholesale uh, basis. Uh, some some elements of our current portfolio, folio, just a couple highlights. Um, we do a lot of work in preventing and countering violent extremism. There's a huge issue in the Sahel and Chad Basin. I'm talking about West Africa here, where a complex set of issues related to demographics, extreme poverty, poor governance, climate change, environmental degradation, and recently the entry of a lot of guns and violent extremist ideologies coming down from the Maghreb, mostly um, 
uh, Libya and Algeria. And that has created sort of a witch's brew where you have violent extremist groups co-opting local populations and sort of sweeping across the countryside, uh, capturing territory, financial flows, and aspiring with sponsorship from both ISIS and Al-Qaeda um, to create an Islamic caliphate. Um, so that, that's a big issue and it threatens to cancel a lot of the progress that's been made over past years in, in these areas, in these very um, uh, poverty stricken areas. In the area of health, uh, we have a regional HIV and AIDS program in, in 10 countries in West Africa. The HIV AIDS epidemic in West Africa is driven by key populations, which um, are commercial sex workers and men who have sex with men. That's where the virus lives. So those, those are the uh, groups we focus on working with. Uh, we also have a, a family planning uh, programs in all nine Francophone countries in West Africa, uh, noting, noting here that the three youngest countries in the world are in the Sahel, that's Mali, Burkina Faso, and, and Niger. And then I'll mention economic growth as well. We manage a regional trade and investment hub aimed at increasing two-way trade and job creation between the United States and, and uh, West Africa in this case. And because I'm an environment guy and I entered USAID as a uh, environment officer, uh, also interesting to me is we have a transboundary biodiversity conservation program focused on coastal mangrove conservation and conservation of remnant forests along the littoral state, which includes quite a bit of chimpanzee habitat. Uh, and that area is from Guinea over to, to Cote d'Ivoire. So, uh, so what does that mean in terms of day-to-day -day for me? Uh, we have something called a program cycle. So all this money doesn't come automatically. Uh, we, every five years, will come up with a, uh, a strategic plan where we consult with local actors, uh, with the interagency, with, with members of Congress, uh, and have that strategy approved, which then gets translated into a series of activities across West Africa that we outsource to NGOs, to contracting firms, to government entities, um, post government entities. And then we monitor, uh, engage, uh, report, and it goes sort of like in, in a cycle where we uh, implement, monitor, evaluate, and learn, and then adjust the programs over time and keep our strategies updated. So, you know, what I mainly do as a, as a senior manager, I don't get my hands very dirty in this program. Mainly it's about managing and motivating people, keeping them on point, and supporting them to get the job done. I do quite a bit of interaction with uh, uh, regional organizations like um, uh, well, ECOWAS, it's the Regional Economic Community in, in West Africa and, and a number of others. Uh, and all, all of the US ambassadors in West Africa are my clients. I, I work for them and uh, make sure that what I'm doing in there domains or the countries that they um, uh, that they oversee in terms of our relationships and, and make sure that I am being accountable to them as well. So again, I'm your taxpayer dollars at work. I'm part of the US government. I'm a foreign service officer at your service. Back Thank to you, Marshall. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. And also um, was realizing I'm continuing to improve my African geography knowledge, even through your presentation, it was very helpful um, hearing more about even just the geography. Uh, so thank you. Um, in short, um, both of you, you know, listed a bunch of a uh, handful of organizations you work with. I, w I was wondering if you just really quickly, if you had any recommendations for associations or trade magazines that other, um, that individuals that are, are, again, starting their career could look towards for for guidance, for 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 best practices um, that you two might be following. I know as your roles have changed through the years, that might have also changed. Um, but I'm just curious if you had any off the top of your head that you use currently. Um, you know, nothing. 
I'm going to say nothing really comes to my mind immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we've been doing this too long. <laughs> uh, for some of the planners that I work with, they, they'll they quote the planning association. For me, it's like a local government association that's not ICMA, but also ICMA. Um, a couple others are like the, the Chronicles of Higher Education, since I'm kind of in that boundary spanning between universities and higher education uh, and local governments. But if there's nothing really coming to mind, you two are at kind of a different echelon than than some of us on our our, our beginning stages of our career. So um, you could create your own professional association, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, well, so, you know, from my side, uh, I mean, part, part of my job is to uh, encourage and, and recruit the next generation of foreign service officers. So, um, you know, I, I do do a number of informational interviews with people who are interested in development or the foreign service and I give them guidance. So it's always possible if you're interested in development field to reach out and speak to people in the field and ask to talk to them and find out how, how they got started. For me, as you, as you heard, Peace Corps gave me a taste of this and I liked it and I continued. And the thing that made a difference for me is I, I rolled the dice, I took a chance, I stuck my neck out, I bought a ticket to Cameroon and was proactive and that landed me a not very high paying job, but a job that got me in the, in the door. In the field, yeah. Yeah, yeah. On a, along those lines, um, Nicole, I was wondering if you could unmute and ask your question now, I think it's appropriate. Um, it seems in line with what Daniel was just sharing or a little bit to counter to it, but, but it related nonetheless. Yeah, definitely. I was just wondering, because both of you got into the field by going through Peace Corps, and I was just wondering if, you know, you've heard or had other folks that have gotten into the field of foreign service or sustainability not going through Peace Corps, and then maybe what those kind of career paths might look like. Yeah, that's a good question, um, Nicole. Um, you know, actually, in in my case, Peace Corps um, played to my advantage because when I finished um, in, and graduated from Davis with a with a master's um, degree, um, there was a, a job announcement to, at FAO and it was kind of one of these two year entry positions, kind of junior internship thingy, uh, pay, paid by USDA and DA in fact. But they were looking for someone who had a couple of years of experience already in Africa and who spoke Arabic. And so I was lucky because Peace Corps you know, gave me all of that. And, you know, over the years, of course, um, I've been on lots of panels, interview panels and looking for, you know, people to work at FAO and stuff to fill certain positions. And, and those that come, you know, from the states that have Peace Corps um, experience, they're given a, a much higher priority um, to, to, to work, um, at least at FAO. Um, there might be, a, you know, other ways to 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 enter, but still, I think Peace Corps is a very valid um, way to get into into working overseas. Uh, maybe with the UN in the UN system, or, or perhaps you know in in the USAID system, or Foreign Service, or other uh, other systems. Um, there's other possibilities. I mean, there are UN internships that are available, um, but uh, of course. They can be extremely, um, you know, competitive, um, and and they're not, you know, very numerous. Uh, yeah. So, as I said earlier, you know, if you, if you want to go into the development field, like Keith and I are in, there's actually not a lot of jobs there, so it is it is a little bit competitive at times. But if you're persistent, you can you can you can make it. Um, Peace Corps is not for everyone. It's a two-year commitment, and you may decide that, you know, after being Peace Corps, that you don't want to be in, in, in development. And, uh, but but I, I agree with Keith's statement, you know, regardless of what happens, Keith, Peace Corps is a life-changing experience that you can never be taken away from you, and you will have something that literally a tiny, tiny handful of Americans have that that give you perspectives that are unbelievably valuable and will set you apart from everyone else. It will make you better, frankly, than everyone else. I shouldn't say that. So, but uh, for, so USA. So the, there are many ways to get experience. Sometimes the frustrating thing is it's hard to get your foot in the door and get that experience that an employer requires uh, to to you know to qualify, right? But it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be paid. It doesn't have to be for two years. I know a number of people who have done, you know, volunteer shorter programs in the in domestically or overseas 
Uh, like the UN, the US government has a number of intern programs. USAID uh, itself has uh, intern programs for both undergraduates and, and graduates. That's a way to get experience and sort of test the thing out. So does the State Department. Actually, most foreign service officers work for the State Department. They work in embassies and do things like consular affairs and things like that. Um, they don't only work in developing countries like, like Keith and I. They also may be posted to Rome or Paris, uh, things like that. But that's also an interesting career to folks. So, so you just need to look around and get some experience. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be paid. When I'm looking at CVs of recruits for for my unit, I don't I don't I don't care if it's what the salary is. I just want to see that someone has kind of been field tested and is, is committed to that sort of thing. I hope that helps, Nicole. It does thank you both. Next question I have is uh, related to for you two to answer about um, is. What did you learn at Willamette while you were there from either your faculty or other staff that continue to impact your work today? And then the follow-up question, if you don't have an answer about how faculty or staff, I, uh, I'm wondering how your relationship with each other has also impacted your work today. Because um, I realize you two are pretty close. Um, so you can take either one, whatever order you want. Uh, and this will be... Uh, more or less the last uh, the last question before we hand it over to panel uh, participants. I think I remember from Ulama that that's kind of striking is I had some really tough professors um, and I had some really easy ones and it's the easy ones that I forgot, but it's the tough ones um, who I remembered, um, you know, especially in, in Collins Hall. And um, I think that that, you know, kind of taught me it was an experience at the time I hated it you know that I thought these professors are really <laughs> giving me a hard time and then you know they're asking too many hard questions and, and the exams are just too tough but, but it was only later that I, I kind of appreciated you know what what they were trying to do and I had some similar professors at Davis too and and, and again in the end you get the most out of those those classes and, the, and those professors and and we had a chemistry teacher is a very short lady um, Francis Chapel. I think uh, was her name. And, and that was, she was an incredibly dynamic person. And, and she already seemed to be about a hundred years old when I was in, 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 in at Willamette, but I was just in contact her, you know, not too long ago. Uh, and, and it was amazing. And cause she still, you know, remembered, you know, some of her students. And I thought that that was really, you know, the sign of a, of a good teacher. So, so that was kind of a, a, a takeaway from, from, well, I don't know if that answers your question at all, but anyway, back to you, Marshall. I'll hand it to Daniel. Yeah, so yeah, so, yeah, I, I remember most of my professors and and some of them, you know, I would have, you know, things that I remember and really took away and internalized from them. I, I don't remember everyone's name, but, you know, I remember an environmental ethics course was particularly compelling for me. Uh, my ge geology and environmental geology courses, I really in enjoyed and connected with the professor. You know, outside of the courses, I, I, I was on the tennis team and the soccer team and a member of the Kappa Sigma fraternity with, with Keith. And to succeed in, in my field, the most important skills are, are not the technical skills. Anyone can learn those. And what I learned playing on a tennis team, an individual sport, and on a soccer team, and being in a fraternity is, is how to get along with people, how to work at a, as a team, how to, you know, understand and leverage different sorts of, of, of diversity. You know, Keith, Keith can tell you that we had a couple of Japanese students in our fraternity who didn't speak really super good English, and engaging with them was a really learning experience for us. So, you know, when, when I'm interviewing folks for my, my team, I'm most interested in those soft skills and people's adaptability and flexibility to do whatever it takes to ad advance, advance the mission. So don't, don't sell those skills straight. It's, it's great to get good academic grades, but the most important thing is, is the, the soft skills you come away with. That's what's gonna get you far in life. That's what's gonna make you a, a, a whole person. 
And to end bef- my segment of question and answers, uh, Daniel, looking at you, what is a coleopterus? So coleopterus. So, you know, <laughs> as I, as I joked early on, you know, there's not a lot of diversity on this panel, right? You got two, two dudes, white Three. Anglo-Saxon male, uh, and two dudes uh, organizing it. Right. The <laughs> Californians who both went to Alameda, both in the same fraternity, graduated a year apart, Peace Corps volunteers, went to UC Davis. Keith intuits the behavior of locusts. So Coleoptera is the scientific name for beetles. And I, I don't know if it's because I envied Keith and his insects, but I, I picked up collecting beetles as a hobby when I was first in Africa, and obviously insects are abundant there. So I'm a coleopterist. I, I collect and study beetles as a, as a hobby. That's, that's what a coleopterist is. All right. Thank you for clarifying that for us. Uh, and I'll hand it to Ann Walton, who's one of our um, leadership team members who helps Wooston kind of keep going forward, the sustainability network that this is a f- affinity group that this is a part of. So Ann, you had a couple, I, I want to invite you in to, to talk because I think you have a connection to these two as well. Okay, hopefully you can hear me. I'm actually at my son's house with two little grandsons. So uh, that's the interruptions. Um, yeah, two amazing guys. They were great guys, obviously, when we were classmates. So nothing a surprise here. But um, I think in um, I circled around. I'd have loved a career like them. I missed that. But I circle around. And I know Marshall, he was one of my charges when he was an undergrad. And I have a connection with the Xena Farm and the Environmental Science and Biology Department still. And I love hearing what both Keith and Dan said, because these are exactly the kind of connections and the multi-layered experiences that we give um, students doing research out at Xena Farm, which is right next to my personal farm, um, so that they have a variety of skills and not just the technical stuff and memorizing bees and flowers and um, to give them that um, diversity of skills to be able to go out in the world and make a difference. And so it's just great to hear that um, what we're telling them <laughs> uh, will work out there. You guys are the proof of that, of a full and fulfilling career and, and, and a great you know, personal life and, and, and great adventures too um, because of your careers. So it's just great to see both of you. And I haven't seen Keith in, in years, but um, uh, Dan and I stay in regular connection, obviously. So anyway, thanks, Marshall. Um, I don't have any specific question. I guess I know thanks, to, they covered I covered that really well. And I know they're both guys that if students wanted to reach out to them with questions or how to get involved. Um, I got excited about those mangrove forests, Dan. I have uh, younger students in my school that are in middle and high school interested in that field. So I know that's sort of a hot topic. Any questions from our participants, uh, Marissa, Sanbo, or Nicole? Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Shambo. I'm the uh, alumni from Willamette Atkinson, the MBA program, the class uh, uh, 18. So really appreciate, you know, our host to have this great alumni event um, and really uh, getting lots of interesting uh, knowledge about Daniel and the uh, kids, you know, from your own fields. So um, my my own background is in angel investments, but, but I have a couple of questions coming from some of the volunteer work I've been doing. Uh, I'm a board member serving on the Oregon China Council. Uh, it's a 501c3 uh, nonprofit. Uh, basically, we are the main platform helping the state governments uh, with our uh, Oregon sistership with the Fujian province and Tianjin uh, in China. And I think as you know, we're, we're all being kind of facing a special time between the two countries. We're trying to focus on the subnational and really promote the people to people exchange because we are seeing different picture that um, both sides, people from both sides are actually working together and really supportive on this great relationship. So um, for example, this year, one of the main thing that the, the council is focused on is climate change and the, the SDG goals um, from the uh, United Nations. Uh, so, so, so my question is, um, well, we're trying to find a common area that both big country can work together 
you know, uh, from all the experts from you guys, um, do you see any specific areas that you are seeing good, you know, partnership uh, or, or a good collaboration going on that's worth for keep, you know, promoting? And then I'm happy to bring that topic or theme, even inviting some of you to, to the council as a speaker to, to kind of speaking on this, this area. Please uh, give some advice. Thank you. No, um, for sure. We, we as FAO, we do a lot of work with China. Um, and probably that interaction has increased a lot since our, our, our director general um, is a Chinese. So, so that's helped to, to kind of solidify that link, which was very, um, historically was very um, weak. But in the, in, in the past three years since he's been DG, um, we've really had this opportunity to explore um, much more what China can offer, especially technically, let's say, in, in the field of agriculture, food security. And, and in my, my um, uh, case, in fact, I'm working with a lot of the, the Chinese scientists from, from CAS, from the Chinese Agricultural um, Sciences, on, on migratory pests. So um, China has its own type of locust, for example. Um, they also are facing fall armyworm, which you know completely invaded Africa in 2016 and then spread throughout Africa and, and Asia thereafter. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work um, with them, um, not just kind of like you know scientific or technical work, but development work. You know the work that Daniel's been talking about in in, in Africa and seeing how we can leverage um, their expertise and integrate it with expertise from other areas, um, whether it's in, in North America, Europe, or uh, local expertise in Africa and Asia, to to come up with um, better solutions for farmers. Um, to, to manage these pests. Um, because, you know, a pest like the fall armyworm that gets into the far, uh, farmer's fields and eats their corn, um, at the end of the day, it's the farmer who suffers and it's also the farmer who is responsible for managing that pest. So um, China has a lot of kind of um, local um, um, technologies that can be used easily, you know, at the farm um, level by farmers. And so it, it's really exciting to, to work with that. So I would be very happy, of course, to, to, to work with you and, and see how we can push that even um, um, more forward. Yeah, so thanks thanks for the, the, the question and comment, Shambo. So uh, let, let me talk about it in a general sense. Um, you know, the government of China, I don't remember, it was about 15 years ago, created a development agency. You know, China has gone through remarkable development, made incredible progress, and, and is also a donor nation now. And we actually have a development counselor. We, USAID, has a development counselor position in China to liaise with, I, I forget the, what the development agency is, is called, but... I, I recall when I was assigned to Tanzania, um, we welcomed a delegation from this from this um, Chinese development um, agency, plus some university professors, to advise the Tanzanian government on what they can learn from China's development journey, which again was remarkable. If you look at the economic growth. And a lot of African countries want to model that sort of state-led growth pattern. What's interesting, the interesting point that I remember coming from the Chinese delegation, it says, well, yes, you can get there if you have economic growth at this level and do these things, but you know what? You're going to have to reduce your population growth. Of course, in the case of China, they controlled the population growth and that really paid off in terms of in terms of the rate of development. Now on climate change, you know, obviously as the two largest global emitters, China and the United States need to be on the same page. And we, as part of the executive branch of government, sometimes we get pushed this way or that way, whether it's on abortion or climate change, depending on who's in the White House, right? Uh, we just went through four years of climate what? Right. And now we have uh, an administration. We have uh, John Kerry in a, a climate change uh, special, special envoy. And, you know, we're, we're, we're active again. So for, for, for our part as a development agency, we now receive climate change funds. 
and we're able to partner with African governments to try and do things. And of course, Africa is very interested, but um, they're also the most susceptible to climate change. And I think the battle here is really the, the big emitters, China and the United States and other developed countries that need to get their act together. You know, there's an African saying that when the elephants fight, the grass suffers. And that's what's happening here. And I hope that our governments can get their act together and be a little more committed to uh, the, a, a global solution so that we can make sure that everyone um, doesn't suffer from, you know, desertification, rising sea levels, et cetera, et cetera. And where I live and work in the Sahel, that is some of the most very, uh, um, susceptible landscape in, in the world where you have people already living on the very edge, edge of poverty. So great, great question. We need, we need to work together, whether it's with the government of Fujian or the government of yes. China. Yes, I, I would like to share uh, Thank you. kind of good news for for us. Uh, uh, we we help the Credit Lake or Credit Lake establish a national sister park relationship with the Mountain We. It's a big mountain national park in China, and they uh, China just built their first first tier of the national park system. So those two parks are working together in scientific mm -hmm. research and many things. So uh, you know we're we're open, you know, to to have more experts like you guys to to helping, you know, kind of really highlight the point that we should work together on those kind of things that will make the really our society and things better. So really appreciate all the comments. Thank you. Thank you, um, Nicole. I think I have time for one more of your questions, and then I've got a one one last one that Eric and I. Um, put our heads together on um, that came together. So, Nicole, do you have any other questions? Uh, yeah, I had a question. Um, Daniel, you had spoken to it a little bit, um, just how much the soft skills and how much you look for those in hiring and how much those have helped you versus, you know, those kind of more hard technical skills. And I was wondering if both of you have any recommendations on how to um, better advertise those soft skills in interviews and to future employers and that sort of thing. Um, and really let those be highlighted and, you know, what you've seen in folks applying to your programs that has really struck you in terms of their soft skills. So, so I, you know, when, when I interview people or suggest interview questions for our, our, our team who are interviewing staff, you know, it, it's sort of a two-way thing. Thing, right. So I, I will ask questions to try and bring out or suss out those soft skills. Right. And so, so I think that does a lot of the trick right there. Uh, as the interviewee, you, you need to be you need to be yourself. You need to be frank and honest. Uh, people appreciate that. We, we all know that anyone can learn after 30 years to intuit where a locust is going to go. But no one can develop you know, the, the, the presentation and interpersonal skills that, that, that Keith has without actually doing it. So, so you know, you, be yourself, let the interviewer draw those things out. And if, if they're not, then maybe you don't want to work for them, but you can figure out ways of letting them know who you are as, as, as a person. But, you know, the thing I look for the, the very most is I want someone who doesn't you know, said, okay, I'm going to do this. And that's all I'm going to do for you. I want someone who's going to step up and outside their comfort zone to help the team when, when it, when it's needed. Someone who's going to be part of a team, not just, a, you know, a solo player. Yeah, I think that's the same for, for me. Um, exactly. You know, we're looking for team, team players. We're looking for people that think out of the box um, we're not looking for straight A students. We're, we're not looking for for um, people that you know are just completely technical oriented. You know they have to be people oriented. Um, and and I think uh, as Daniel said, uh, it's just, it works the same way with the UN. Uh, we we ask the questions and we we try to assess that things out those things out. But always, I think when you try to answer questions try to answer them in a balanced way. I mean, you obviously want to present your, your technical um, uh, achievements or experience or expertise, but don't forget the human side. I, I think that's that's really critical to, to you know, kind of make your, your interviewers aware of, 
uh, you know, your abilities to, to work um, with different types of people, different languages, different ethnicities um, in different countries, uh, yeah, and give them some examples maybe. And you might think that's kind of trivial, but, but you know, in the end, it, it makes you kind of more human as an interviewee. Yeah. Thank you, Keith. Uh, and this one question, I feel like I can actually answer to a little bit. So I'll just add one or two things, Nicole, and, and that is, Daniel's advice of be frank and honest is true, but you need to have that story ready to go. And you, if you don't have the story ready from your experience, the example in a nice, easy to use, maybe you're using SBAR or you're using the STAR framework, some type of framework that helps you get to the point quickly, but also gives context. If you don't have that story ready, then maybe you need to go get the experience a little bit more. So that way you do have the story ready. And so I think Keith brought that up in his answer. Like you have the example, great. If you don't, maybe you need to go get it, but, but otherwise like be honest and Frank and, and be ready with those, those stories and examples to highlight your skills and ability because uh, sometimes you don't get those questions, but you might still want the job as, as Daniel alluded to. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, Marissa, you're back from one of the calls. So I was wondering if you had, uh, uh, I know you've been stepping in and out. So if you, if you don't have a question, I have one last question. Um, but I want to make sure that Marissa, if you have time, uh, Marissa also volunteers to help with the, the sustainability network a little bit. So I want to make sure if you have anything you can ask, but if you don't, I'll move on. Yeah, I don't have any specific questions, um, but I just wanted to thank the panelists. It's been really, really interesting um, to hear about what you're doing overseas. So thanks. Um, my final question to both of you is what is one science or policy item that is not really focal in the media? that you think everyone should know about as it pertains to the sustainability of humankind? Not a small subject, but an ending mm -hmm. subject. I mean, what immediately comes to my mind, and, and this, this occurs when I, I go back to the States and you know visit my, my parents and my, my mom and my brother, um, is the absolute kind of ignorance of Americans about the world. America is just completely isolated huh? and they're on their own planet. And, and I think it, what is so sad, um, you know, having, you know, spent my whole career trying to, to help, you know, um, let's say the developing world is, you know, the, just the number of people that, you know, are going to bed tonight with no food, no dinner, and, and they have no idea if they're going to, you know, have a meal tomorrow. Um, and it's, you know, th those numbers are increasing. They're not going down despite, you know, uh, you know the UN's best intentions, USAID's best efforts. Um, we're not making progress there. And, and then, you know, you see a, an event like the Ukraine-Russia, you know, war that's just going to have enormous impacts on agriculture that we haven't even yet to, to fathom. You know, we're hearing about it slowly in the news about, you know, impacts on fertilizer and these things. But this all comes back to the same point, you know, there's just too many people on this planet that, you know, um, are, are not able to, to have enough food to eat. And, and yeah, that, that's very sad. Yeah, you know, that, that's very compelling. And Keith kind of draws me in that same direction there. You know, the, your, your taxpayer dollars, less than 1% of the federal budget goes to foreign assistance. And this is in our, our, not only in our national interest to create future markets, um, goodwill, uh, protect the homeland from migration, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we as Americans like to think that we're a humanitarian people. Well, you know, when you compare us to other nations in terms of the percentage of our national budget, we we, we spend to, to help other less fortunate areas, it's, we, we really suck. We really suck. We may be the biggest, but we're also the biggest economy in the world. We should be giving uh, more. And, you know, people don't know, for example, we, we see what's happening in Ukraine. That's in Europe. The problem I described in Burkina Faso and, and, and Mali and, and Niger is an order of magnitude more distressing. There are more people displaced. And, the, and these are, you know, people that are already living literally on the edge of existence and have challenges feeding and educating their, 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 their young. And you have these extremist groups which are funded from outside that are 
literally slaughtering entire villages at a time. You know, every month, like a village will be completely overrun. Every single person will be killed. Every single hut will be burnt. That's happening. You don't see it in the press because these are poor people. They're people of, of color and we don't really care. Maybe you see it a little more in France, but there are situations around in the world. And if we're really the humanitarian people we think we are, that awareness that Keith's talking about, the lack of awareness would benefit the American people to know the planet we live on. And I, and I think there would, with that awareness, would come a little more advocacy, perhaps through your vote, your, your, your congressperson or whatever. Maybe we ought to do a little bit more and, and pull our own weight. We're not really pulling our own weight. We, we, we say we are, but we're, we're really not. I'll stop Thank you. There. Thank you both. Um, this group is designed to help those who have any type of affiliation with the, the big S sustainability to feel like they have a space if they were, you know, at once at Willamette or a staff at Willamette uh, or are currently at Willamette. And so we found that we have like three areas to act. One is to connect people, which is what we're doing today. Uh, a little bit of resource and education uh, is another thing. That's kind of another thing we're kind of doing today. Um, but the other one is advocacy. And so I think that last question kind of helps us understand as a group, you know, what's another area of advocacy we could undertake. And so thank you for answering those questions. Um, I don't like to, uh, and so thank you. Um, uh, I want to, I just need to wrap up really quick and then um, we can leave the room open if others want to stay on uh, and discuss more if we need to, but we'll, we'll end the recording at that time. Um, thank you uh, to our panelists. Um, as mentioned earlier, this event is hosted by the Willamette University Sustainability Network or WUSIN is the acronym um, for it. If you hear us use that acronym, uh, it's the new affinity group, again, of graduates, staff, faculty, current students interested in sustainability related issues or who work in sustainability related fields. Many of our alumni engage primarily to build connections, share resources, advocate for change, and anyone interested in participating at any level can join our network uh, using the new uh, Willamette or uh, Woo Connect platform, which is hosted on a, a software called Wiser, W-S-I-R. Uh, you can find us at Willamette dot, uh, uh oh, I forgot the URL. One second, let me look it up. Oh, Willamette dot. WISR.io. You can log in using your LinkedIn or create a, a LinkedIn password. And then once you're approved, you can find us under the community page. Uh, Willamette staff uh, make sure people join are from Willamette community to make it our, our space. And they, um, once you're there again, you can find the Woosin page or the, the Willamette University Sustainability Network page and keep up to date on what we're doing and the discussions we're having. And also, you can connect with one another for follow up interviews, informational session or informational interviews. Um, one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, it provides a platform that, for that in a safe and comfortable way. Uh, thank you both again uh, for joining us, uh, Daniel and Keith. Um, I, again, had heard from you from Diana, Diana Barra, but also um, Keith, some of the folks at ASU, the Global um, Center for Sustainability and uh, the Global Change Center or whatever it's called. Um, they, <laughs> they keep changing the name on me. <laughs> um, uh, I have worked with some colleagues there and uh, they talk highly of you. And so I just Really appreciated you all being here, sharing your wisdom with some of our uh, of our members, as well as the Willamette community in general. Uh, and thank you lastly to Eric Lasson uh, and Willamette for providing the Zoom and communication for this event. I uh, really appreciate it. Well, thank, thank you very Eric. much, Marshall, for hosting us um, today. And Daniel and Keith, I can't thank you enough. I, I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedules. Um, in the different time zones in Ghana and Rome to uh, to be with us today. Your insights were extremely valuable. And uh, and I hope that not only the folks, you know, in the session today in real time um, got as much out of the session as I did, but I really hope that all the folks who will watch the recording in the future um, enjoy and appreciate it as well. And I hope uh, if, if we haven't gotten you two on Woo Connect yet, I hope that we can, I'd love to help you get on there and make sure that you're, uh, if you're willing to be available through that channel, that would be a great way for folks watching this recording to then come back in and, um, and reach out to Daniel and Keith directly. So hopefully our audience found this valuable and, uh, and are further inspired to, uh, to pursue a career in sustainability and, and hopefully even uh, in the USAID or foreign service or, uh, or, the kind of research that that helps us appreciate
predict uh, catastrophic events around the world. Um, these are really amazing stories. So I really deeply appreciate the two of you sharing them with us today and hope to see you all on the, in the Wusun community on WooConnect. So much appreciation to you all. Uh, thanks for joining us today and take care, everyone.